THE CHILD OF THE EVENING STAR Once upon a time, on the shores of the great lake Gichigumi, there lived a hunter who had ten beautiful young daughters. Their hair was dark and glossy as the wings of a blackbird, and when they walked or ran it was with the grace and freedom of the deer in the forest. Thus it was that many suitors came to court them, brave and handsome young men, straight as arrows, fleet of foot, who could travel from sun to sun without fatigue. They were sons of the prairie, wonderful horsemen, who could ride at breakneck speed without saddle or stirrup. They could catch a wild horse with a noose, tame him in a magical way by breathing into his nostrils, then mount him and gallop off as if he had always been ridden. There were those also who came from afar in canoes across the waters of the great lake, canoes which shot swiftly along, urged by the strong, silent sweep of the paddle. All of them brought presents, with which they hoped to gain the father's favor. Feathers from the wings of the eagle who soars high up near the sun, furs of the fox and beaver and the thick, curly hair of the bison, beads of many colors, and wampum, the shells which the Indians used for money, the quills of the porcupine, and the claws of the grizzly bear, deerskin dressed to such a softness that it crumpled up in the hands, those and many other things they brought. One by one the daughters were wooed and married, until nine of them had chosen husbands. One by one other tents were reared, so that instead of the single family lodge on the shores of the lake, there were tents enough to form a little village, for the country was a rich one, and there was game and fish for all. There remained the youngest daughter, Oweenie, the fairest of them all. Gentle as she was proud, none was so kind of heart. Unlike her proud and talkative elder sisters, Oweenie was shy and modest, and spoke but little. She loved to wander alone in the woods, with no company but the birds and squirrels and her own thoughts. What these thoughts were, we can only guess, from her dreamy eyes and her sweet expression, one could but suppose nothing selfish or mean or hateful ever came into her mind. Yet Oweenie, Modest though she was, had a spirit of her own. More than one suitor had found this out. More than one conceited young man, confident that he could win her, went away crestfallen when Oweenie began to laugh at them. The truth is, Oweenie seemed hard to please. Suitor after suitor came, handsome tall young men, the handsomest and the bravest in all the country round, yet this fawn-eyed maiden would have none of them. One was too tall, another too short, one too thin, another too fat. At least that was the excuse she gave for sending them away. Her proud sisters had little patience with her. It seemed to be a questioning of their own taste, for Oweenie, had she said the word, might have gained a husband more attractive than any of theirs. Yet no one was good enough. They could not understand her. So they ended by despising her as a silly and unreasonable girl. Her father, too, who loved her dearly and wished her to be happy, was much puzzled. "'Tell me, my daughter,' he said to her one day, "'is it your wish never to marry? "'The handsomest young men in the land have sought you in marriage, "'and you have sent them all away, often with a poor excuse. "'Why is it?' Oweenie looked at him with her large, dark eyes. Father, she said at last, it is not that I am willful, but it seems somehow as if I had the power to look into the hearts of men. It is the heart of a man and not his face that really matters, and I have not yet found one youth who, in this sense, is really beautiful. Soon afterward, a strange thing happened. There came into the little village an Indian named Oseo, many years older than Oweenie. He was poor and ugly, too. Yet Oweenie married him. 
How the tongues of her nine proud sisters did wag! Had the spoiled little thing lost her mind, they asked? Oh, well, they had always knew she would come to a bad end, but it was pretty hard on the family. Of course, they could not know what Oweeny had seen at once, that Oseo had a generous nature and a heart of gold, that beneath his outward ugliness was the beauty of a noble mind and the fire and passion of a poet. That is why Oweeny loved him. Knowing, too, that he needed her care, she loved him all the more. Now, though Oweeny did not expect it, Oseo was really a beautiful youth upon whom an evil spell had been cast. He was, in truth, the son of the king of the evening star, that evening star which shines so gloriously in the western sky just above the rim of the earth as the sun is setting. Often on a clear evening it hung suspended in the purple twilight like some glittering jewel, so close it seemed, and so friendly, that the little children would reach out their hands, thinking that they might grasp it ere it was swallowed by the night, and keep it always for their own. But the older ones would say, Surely it must be a bead on the garments of the great spirit as he walks in the evening through the garden of the heavens. Little did they know that the poor, despised Oseo had really descended from that star. And when he, too, stretched out his hands toward it, and murmured words they could not understand, they all made sport of him. There came a time when a great feast was prepared in a neighboring village, and all of Oweenie's kinfolk were invited to attend. They all set out on foot, the nine proud sisters with their husbands walking ahead, much pleased with themselves and their finery and all chattering like magpies. But Oweenie walked behind in silence, and with her walked Oseo. The sun had set. In the purple twilight over the edge of the earth sparkled the evening star. Oseo, pausing, stretched out his hands toward it as if imploring pity. But when the others saw him in this attitude, they all made merry, laughing and joking and making unkind remarks. Instead of looking up in the sky, said one of the sisters, he had better be looking on the ground, else he may stumble and break his neck. Then, calling back to him, she cried, Look out! Here's a big log! Do you think you can manage to climb over it? Oseo made no answer, but when he came to the log, he paused again. It was the trunk of a huge oak tree blown down by the wind. There it had lain for years, just as it fell, and the leaves of many summers lay thick upon it. There was one thing, though, the sisters had not noticed. The tree trunk was not a solid one, but hollow, and so big around that a man could walk inside it from one end to the other without stooping. But Oseo did not pause because he was unable to climb over it. There was something mysterious and magical in the appearance of that great hollow trunk, and he gazed at it a long time as if he had seen it in a dream, and had been looking for it ever since. "'What is it, Oseo?' asked Oweenie, touching him on the arm. "'Do you see something that I cannot see?' But Oseo only gave a shout that echoed through the forest and leaped inside the log. Then, as Oweeny, a little alarmed, stood there waiting, the figure of a man came out the other end. Could this be Oseo? Yes, it was he, but how transformed! No longer bent and ugly, no longer weak and ailing, but a beautiful youth, vigorous and straight and tall. His enchantment was at an end. But the evil spell had not been wholly lifted, after all. As Oseo approached, he saw that a great change was taking place in his loved one. Her glossy black hair was turning white. Deep wrinkles lined her face, and she walked with a feeble step leaning on a staff. Though he had regained his youth and beauty, she, in turn, had suddenly grown old. 
Oh, my dearest one, he cried, the evening star has mocked me in letting this misfortune come upon you. Better far that I had remained as I was. Gladly would I have borne the insults and laughter of your people rather than you should be made to suffer. As long as you love me, answered Oweenie, I am perfectly content. If I had the choice to make, and only one of us could be young and fair, it is you that I would wish to be beautiful. Then he took her in his arms and caressed her, vowing that he loved her more than ever for the goodness of her heart, and together they walked hand in hand as lovers do. When the proud sisters saw what had happened, they could scarcely believe their eyes. They looked enviously at Oseo, who was now far handsomer than any one of their husbands, and much their superior in every way. In his eyes was the wonderful light of the evening star, and when he spoke all men turned to listen and admire him. But the hard-hearted sisters had no pity for Oweenie. Instead, it rather pleased them to see that she could no longer dim their beauty, and to realize that people would no longer be singing her praises in their jealous ears. The feast was spread, and all made merry but Oseo. He sat like one in a dream, neither eating nor drinking. From time to time he would press Oweenie's hand and speak a word of comfort in her ear, but for the most part he sat there gazing through the door of the tent at the star-besprinkled sky. Soon a silence fell on all the company. From out of the night, from the dark, mysterious forest, came the sound of music, a low, sweet music that was like yet unlike the song sung by the thrush in the summer twilight. It was magical music, such as none had ever heard, coming, as it seemed, from a great distance, and rising and falling on the quiet summer evening. All those at the feast wondered as they listened, and well they might, for what to them was only music was to Oseo a voice that he understood, a voice from the sky itself, the voice of the evening star. These are the words he heard. Suffer no more, my son, for the evil spell is broken, and hereafter no magician shall work you harm. Suffer no more, for the time has come when you shall leave the earth and dwell here with me in the heavens. Before you is a dish upon which my light has fallen, blessing it and giving it a magic virtue. Eat of this dish, Oseo, and all will be well. So Oseo tasted the food before him, and, behold, the tent began to tremble and rose slowly into the air, up, up above the treetops, up toward the stars. As it rose, the things within it were wondrously changed. The kettles of clay became bowls of silver, the wooden dishes were scarlet shells, while the bark of the roof and the poles supporting it were transformed into some glittering substance that sparkled in the rays of the stars. Higher and higher it rose. Then the nine proud sisters and their husbands were all changed into birds. The men became robins, thrushes, and woodpeckers. The sisters were changed into various birds with bright plumage. The four who had chattered most, whose tongues were always wagging, now appeared in the feathers of the magpie and the blue jay. Aseo sat gazing at Oweenie. Would she too change into a bird and be lost to him? The very thought of it made him bow his head with grief. Then. As he looked at her once more, he saw her beauty suddenly restored, while the color of her garments was the color only to be found where the dyes of the rainbow are made. Again the tent swayed and trembled as the currents of the air bore it higher and higher, into and above the clouds, up, 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 till at last it settled gently on the land of the evening star. Oseo and Oweeny caught all the birds and put them in a great silver cage, where they seemed quite content in each other's company. 
Scarcely was this done when Oseo's father, the king of the evening star, came to greet them. He was attired in a flowing robe spun from stardust, and his long white hair hung like a cloud upon his shoulders. Welcome, he said, my dear children. Welcome to the kingdom in the sky that has always awaited you. The trials you have passed through have been bitter, but you have borne them bravely, and now you will be rewarded for all your courage and devotion. Here you will live happily, yet of one thing you must beware. He pointed to a little star in the distance, a little winking star hidden from time to time by a cloud of vapor. On that star, he continued, lives a magician named Wabeno. He has the power to dart his rays like so many arrows at those he wishes to injure. He has always been my enemy. It was he who changed Oseo into an old man and cast him down upon the earth. Have a care that his light does not fall upon you. Luckily his power for evil has been greatly weakened, for the friendly clouds have come to my assistance and form a screen of vapor through which his arrows cannot penetrate. The happy pair fell upon their knees and kissed his hands in gratitude. But these birds, said Oseo, rising and pointing to the cage. Is this also the work of Wabeno the magician? No, answered the king of the evening star. It was my own power, the power of love, that caused your tent to rise and bear you hither. It was likewise my power that the envious sisters and their husbands were transformed into birds. Because they hated you and mocked you, and were cruel and scornful to the weak and old, I have done this thing. It is not so great a punishment as they deserve. Here in their silver cage they will be happy enough, proud of their handsome plumage, strutting and twittering to their heart's content. Hang the cage there, at the doorway of my dwelling. They shall be well cared for. Thus it was that Oseo and Oweni came to live in the kingdom of the evening star. And as the years passed by, the little winking star where Wobino the magician lived grew pale and paler and dim and dimmer, till it quite lost its power to harm. Meanwhile a little son had come to make their happiness more perfect, a charming boy with the dark dreamy eyes of his mother and the strength and courage of Oseo. It was a wonderful place for a little boy to live, close to the stars and the moon, with the sky so near that it seemed a kind of curtain for his bed, and all the glory of the heavens spread out before him. But sometimes he was lonely, and wondered what the earth was like, the earth his father and mother had come from. He could see it far, far below. So far it looked no bigger than an orange, and sometimes he would stretch out his hand toward it, just as the little children on earth would stretch out their hands for the moon. His father made him a bow with little arrows, and this was a great delight to him. But still he was lonely, and wondered what the little boys and girls on earth were doing, and whether they would be nice to play with. The earth must be a pretty place, he thought, with so many people living on it. His mother had told him strange stories of that faraway land, with its lovely lakes and rivers, great green forests where the deer and squirrel lived, and the yellow rolling prairies swarming with buffalo. These birds, too, in a great silver cage, had come from the earth, he was told and there were thousands and thousands just like them, as well as others even more beautiful that he had never seen at all, swans with long curved necks that floated gracefully upon the waters, whippoorwills that called at night from the woods, 
the robin redbreast, the dove and the swallow, what wonderful birds they must be. Sometimes he would sit near the cage, trying to understand the language of the feathered creatures inside. One day a strange idea came into his head. He would open the door of the cage and let them out. Then they would fly back to earth, and perhaps they would take him with them. When his mother and father missed him, they would be sure to follow him to the earth, and then... He could not quite see just how it would all end. But he found himself quite close to the cage. And the first thing he knew, he had opened the door and let out all the birds. Round and round they flew, and now he was half sorry and a little afraid as well. If the birds flew back to earth and left him there, what would his grandfather say? Come back, come back, he called. But the birds only flew around him in circles and paid no attention to him. At any moment they might be winging their way to the earth. Come back, come back, I tell you, he cried, stamping his foot and waving his little bow. Come back, I say, or I'll shoot you. Then, as they would not obey him, he fitted an arrow to his bow and let it fly. So well did he aim that the arrow sped through the plumage of a bird, and the feathers fell all around. The bird itself, a little stunned, but not much hurt, fell down, and a tiny trickle of blood stained the ground where it lay. But it was no longer a bird with an arrow in its wing. Instead, there stood in its place a beautiful young woman. Now, no one who lives in the stars is ever permitted to shed blood, whether it be that of man, beast, or bird. So, when the few drops fell upon the evening star, everything was changed. The boy suddenly found himself sinking slowly downward, held up by invisible hands, yet sinking closer and closer to the earth. Soon he would see its green hills and the swans floating on the water, till at last he rested on a grassy island in a great lake. Lying there, and looking up at the sky, he could see the tent descending, too. Down it softly drifted, till in turn it sank upon the island, and in it were his father and mother, Aseo and Oweni return to earth to live once more among men and women and teach them how to live. For they had learned many things in their life upon the evening star, and the children of earth would be better for the knowledge. They stood there, hand in hand, all the enchanted birds came fluttering after, falling and fluttering through the air, and as each one touched the earth, it was no longer a bird they saw, but a human being. A human being, yet not quite as before. For they were only dwarves, little people or pygmies, puckwudgies as the Indians called them. Happy little people they became, seen only by a few. Fishermen, they say, would sometimes get a glimpse of them, dancing in the light of the evening star on a summer night on the sandy, level beach of the great lake. So ends Child of the Evening Star.